Happy wonderful Wednesday, everyone. My name is Chris Vogt, and today we're going to be talking about top SBA lending questions and answers. So we have a special guest with us today, Kelly Sheen at uh, Plumas Bank here in Auburn, California. I met him through the California Association of Business Brokers and the International Business Brokers Association. Actually, Kelly, we first met in Denver last May, didn't we? We did. It was, yeah, it was last May. It seems like it's crazy that it was that long ago. But um, yeah, that was at uh, it was at IBBA, I think, in 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 Denver that year. Exactly. And so yeah. Kelly and I've got to know each other over the last uh, fifteen months. And I find him to be a very reliable resource for me, very friendly, very responsive. And so he's agreed to join us today to talk about the top questions that he gets asked about SBA lending and his favorite answers to those questions, because sometimes the answers can vary, can't they, Kelly? Yeah, they do. They they <laughs> definitely vary from bank to bank and deal to deal because no deal is the same. So absolutely. Yeah. So let's just start out with what is the SBA lending program? Because there's some people maybe that'll join us either today live or on YouTube, and they just don't even know what the SBA is and and that the, there's government-backed loans. So let's just start with that. Yeah, definitely. So the, the SBA program stands for Small Business Administration. It's actually been in existence since 1953. And the main goal is for them to make uh, loans available to small businesses, you know, throughout the United States. And so much like, if you think of it, um, you know, kind of like the FHA, you know, for residential home loans, and you got the BA, you know, as well, the the SBA basically provides, some people call it insurance, but it's, an, it's a guarantee. So if we underwrite a loan according to SBA policy, the SBA will step in and provide a guarantee to the bank and ensure, you know, Typically, it's about 75% of the loan proceeds um, against uh, loss. So, um, you know, from that position, it helps encourage banks to do loans that typically wouldn't be available through normal lending channels like conventional commercial lending. Um, so, yeah, that that guarantee is really what, uh, what really drives the program. It drives, you know, banks like myself to lend. Awesome. And... I'd like to make sure that everyone knows that I'm very happy that you joined us today, whether you're live or by video, we appreciate you being here. And uh, we hope that this is going to be an excellent addition to your portfolio of understanding SBA lending. Kelly, what kind of loans do you make that the SBA will guarantee? Or do they guarantee even if they're not loans that you will make as your at your institution? So what what we primarily so there's really two types of loans through the SBA program the two most popular ones ones what they call the SBA 7A loan which is basically the universal loan through the SBA any eligible use of the loan proceeds that can be financed under the SBA program can be financed with the 7A so we're talking you know business acquisition um, intangible assets tangible assets commercial real estate inventory. Uh, we can use those for debt refinances of existing debt, you know, as well, debt consolidation stuff. Um, and then the other program is really, uh, it's the SBA 504. Uh, under the 504 program, really the only thing that could be financed with that is, is commercial real estate or heavy, heavy equipment. So primarily what we do, um, and I think probably the, you know, the, the, you know, across the nation, I could kind of, um, you know, speak for Plumas Bank. What we generally do is SBA 7A loans. We got our start back in 2008, really doing business acquisition financing. Got the 504 program out there. There's We participate in those as well. But again, the only thing to be financed with that is typically heavy equipment. What's the definition of heavy equipment? I mean, is it like, um, like a large semi-truck or a tractor? Well, think, of it, or what? think of it more of... Um, like a commercial printing press you got a big commercial printing business that's got like a piece of equipment that's you know five hundred thousand to a million bucks and then you've got you know an econ economic life on that equipment of probably anywhere from like 15 to, to 20 years is, is typically what we see in those situations okay so you're talking about something that's a minimum of half a million dollars for heavy equipment probably yeah absolutely okay and so can that be like a group 
of pieces of equipment that add up to a half a million? Well, I don't think there's necessarily a minimum loan amount per se. It's 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 more so um, the type of the equipment. We Under the 504 program, we're generally looking for commercial real estate. We don't finance a whole lot of equipment underneath that program. Okay, cool. If you have someone who wants to do commercial real estate, but they also need some working capital, would you do two loans for that or would you roll them together into a single loan? Well, underneath that situation, we could actually finance it as one SBA 7A loan you know, for the commercial real estate um, and include the working capital is there as well. So when you do something like that, um, if the company really didn't need the working capital, but you you include working capital, I mean, like they've already got some cash reserves, you could theoretically get to 100% financing on the commercial real estate, right? Uh, possibly, you know, the program, the program it allows, so the, the, the minimum down payment, the maximum financing under the SBA program is 10% down, 90% financing for anything that you're really doing. If you're doing a debt refinance, it's a little bit different, right? You can, you can finance a hundred percent of, you know, whatever debt's looking to be refinanced or in a situation of a partner buyout, typically we use the existing equity to send the business as the injection and, and we could do hundred percent financing of the buyout. But when you're looking at you know down payment what we look at typically we want to see the borrower have some skin in the game right so what we don't like to do is that if the minimum down payment is 10 percent to buy something right business commercial real estate whatever yep what we don't like to do is give them back that 10 percent in working capital because their net investment into the project is essentially zero right so to answer your question yeah working capital can be included but typically there's going to be some threshold that most banks you know across the nation are going to look at as far as them wanting to have skin in the game. Okay. So one of the things that people talk about with SBA versus conventional financing is the fees that are involved. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how do the fees compare between conventional and SBA financing? What are the fees that you typically see in an SBA loan? The biggest fee that you'll see, I mean, there's a lot of the same you know, closing costs, cost of appraisals, environmentals, all of those are going to be pretty much standard, right? So the biggest fee that you're going to see from an SBA perspective is the SBA guarantee fee. And how that fee works is it's it's on a tiered amount, right? So loan amounts zero to five hundred thousand dollars right now, there is no SBA guarantee fee, which is nice, right? Mm -hmm. So and as you start to go up and above five hundred thousand, there's there's different tiers. There's tiers from 500,000 to 700,000, it's 0.055% of the guaranteed portion. And then 700,000 up to a million, and it kind of goes up from there. It goes up to 1% of the guaranteed portion. And then, you know, no, loans above, you know, 1 million up to 5 million, it's it could be about 3.75% of the guaranteed portion. You said 3.75%? So, 3.75%, correct. So that gets pretty hefty as far as the fees then. Well, it, it does, but if you're, you know, the guaranteed portion is 75% of the loan amount, right? So in relation to, you know, I can't really speak on conventional lending because I don't I do not do a lot of conventional lending, obviously, but if you're looking at origination fees of 1% to 2%, you know, as you, those are probably going to be higher in those loan amounts that are less than a million bucks, you know, but up and above, you know, a million dollars up to $5 million, which is the maximum allowable by SBA, is that, yeah, those SBA guarantee fees can be a hundred and I think it's $138,000 on a $5 million loan. So that's a fee that's not charged by the bank. That's charged by SBA. And that mm -hmm. money goes to SBA. What we charge um, is $1,500. Bucks. Whether it's a $100,000 loan or a $5 million loan, that's what our packaging fee is. Then all the other fees, third-party fees. But the biggest one that you typically see is the SBA guaranteed fee. Got it. Let's talk just for a moment about environmental since you brought it up. Sure. When do you see environmental as being an issue? Because a lot of people, they don't even think about environmental. Yeah, they do. So anytime that we're taking commercial real estate as collateral, right, mm -hmm. we've got to do some type of environmental report to determine whether the property is clean or if it's contaminated. You know, when you're dealing with a business that operates in an environmentally sensitive industry, like a gas station, for example, or even a dry cleaning plant that uses chemicals, right? So... Um, or even some auto repair type facilities as well. Is it? It's there's really three different types of environmental reports, right? If it's not an environmentally sensitive industry and we're financing an office complex, it's typically what they call a TSA, which is a transactional screening assessment. 
right? That's kind of a database search, kind of check the records to make sure that there's been no environmental issues on the property. Um, and that's kind of the lowest level. The next step would be a phase one. And that's typically what we see as a starting point for gas stations, right? Mm -hmm. The phase one is a little bit more in depth database search. They check, you know, they go, it's, it's, it's essentially a TSA on steroids. They search, you know, Sanborn property maps, aerial photos, all of that, and kind of go through and, and do a little bit more in depth analysis on the history of the property. And then above that is what they call a phase two environment. And typically, if they see something in the phase one, or if there's prior contamination, or I had this happen to me once, we had a gas station from the 1950s that, uh, um, well, it was a gas station in the 1950s, and we were financing, I forget what it was, it was like an office complex, or or actually, no, it was a convenience store with no gas. Mm -hmm. And uh, had no idea that a gas station ever was there, but there was one back in the 1950s. Obviously, the environmental guidelines were a little bit different back then than they are now, and when they abandoned the gas station, they never removed the tanks and uh, just kind of filled it in and covered it up. And and uh, we there was a phase two environmental that was done that determined that the tanks were still on the ground. And, <laughs> you know, those the phase two can get kind of expensive. Obviously, they do, um, you know, borings, drill down, take soil samples and kind of do all of that stuff. So those are those are typically the three main um, reports that we get or that we look at with environmentals. Okay, perfect. We're talking also about businesses. We got some business brokers on this call, I know. When you're dealing with a business, what are the main factors that you're looking for, say, with a startup company? Startups are a lot harder to finance uh, than in the acquisition of an existing business. So let me let me use kind of both examples here. If you're financing an existing business, which I think primarily is what we look at, we do do startups from time to time. They just got to be a lot stronger. Mm -hmm. So on an acquisition of an existing business, you know, primarily what we're looking at is cash flow, right? We want to analyze, you know, typically we get the last three years tax returns, interim financial statements, profit, loss, and balance sheet. And we could go back and analyze that and look at how much cash flow that business has thrown off historically. And the trending, right? Trending on revenue, trending on expenses, trending on profitability. And then kind of compare that to, you know, how much uh, debt we're looking to lend, do a debt service uh, calculation and kind of come up with a, pretty good idea that, hey, you know, this 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 business from a cash flow perspective supports some debt. For the startup, we don't have that, right? With the startup is that we're relying on the borrower's experience in the industry. Hopefully they have experience in the industry, their business plan, and really, you know, what they're projecting to do over the next two years. With startups, we always require a business plan and require two years of cash projections. Um, and we analyze those, but keep in mind, those are projections are not historical numbers that we could go back and look at, right? Um, you know, with startups, uh, like I said, we, we, we do do them. You got to have experience in the industry. You know, typically with startups, we're looking for somebody that's going to be pledging real estate collateral, right? So if you're looking at, let's use the example of a, a tenant improvement build out for a startup restaurant, our collateral is going to be perishable inventory, some furniture fixtures and equipment right stuff that's probably in some cases permanently attached to the real estate essentially from a collateral perspective we don't we don't have much right so in those instances a lot of times we're looking for a borrower that's got equity in the home something we can cross collateralize kind of help bring that that risk of the overall startup nature of the of the project there's a lot of things happening in the economy right now you know some people think the economy is heading for a collapse other people think it's getting ready to expand but credit has been contracting as interest rates have been going up. Here we are at July 12th, 2023. And now you've been involved in this industry for what, over 20 years? Yeah, so 18 years, 15 years at Plumas Bank. So mm -hmm. I actually started in July of 2008, which was a wonderful time in our economy, if you, if you remember. <laughs> so well, happy over. anniversary. Thank you. It was actually Friday. My 15 year anniversary was Friday. So, oh, but if you, that's you, awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. But if you think back to that time, it, it was it was it was interesting, right? That's when everything was really falling apart. Plumas Bank at that time uh, was trying to build this division, trying to lend on business acquisitions, right? And so, you know, fast forward to 15 years, here we are now with kind of some, I want to say some similar talk, but some similar concerns going on in the economy. To your to your point. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, I've, I've I've been through it. And so, you know, um, interest rates are increasing. If you look back, I think March of last year, the Wall Street Journal prime rate was at three and a quarter. 
right? So the last time it was at three and a quarter, if, if my memory serves me correctly, was around 2010, I think. And then prior to that, it was 1953. So wow. these were historical interest rates that we were seeing in the SBA world because a lot of times, historically, you know, the, the program, like the SBA 70 program has been prime-based, prime-based floating, right? So variable mm -hmm. rates. And typically you would see a spread, you know, the max allowable spread on uh, business acquisition was 2.75% above prime, right? So that's, you know, think about that March of 2000. Three, that would have been a max interest rate of 6%. Very, today, prime's at eight and a quarter, right? The max spread on top of prime is 2.75, right? So we're talking 11% today. So that's a that's a big, big margin difference from interest rates, you know, in loans just, you know, a year and a half ago. So, wow, that's crazy. So in talking about how the economy changes, how does the SBA program change i mean government change programs seem to change over time based on what the government's trying to engineer in our society right so do you see that the sba you know adjust their lending standards or they adjust what are what are do they adjust stuff or and if so what do they adjust as the economy changes so good question one thing to remember is that the sba doesn't lend any money right it's up to the banks the sba provides the guarantee so what you typically, I guess, would see is, is, you know, in a situation to where, you know, credit is being constricted, it's being constricted by the banks, right? Is that the banks are kind of pulling back, changing their lending policy. Um, SBA makes changes, you know, they make changes quite frequently, you know, so, but but majority of what the restrictions come in is when you see banks pulling back and not necessarily SBA. SBA is trying to encourage the banks to lend, right, the money. So there's some changes that SBA just put in recently. They're kind of historical changes. Um you know, they're, that are, you know, well, the waiver of the SBA guarantee fee up to $500,000, you know, mm -hmm. so that's, that's big because that, that just makes it really inexpensive, you know, for, for borrowers to buy at that level, which, you know, that, that dollar amount, that's a lot of you mom and pop, you know, shop type businesses, you know, independent restaurants, business acquisitions, stuff to that nature, fall kind of in that, you know, 700,000, 500,000 and below. So it's not necessarily SBA per se. They're always encouraging the banks to learn money, to tweaking things to kind of help. But really, it's 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 the banks, you know, lending when times are good, and then you know, as things, you know, kind of uh, start heating up in the market, and you know, you see some pullback. Is it the, it's the banks restricting credit? So do you see sometimes that the Fed and uh, SBA are maybe at odds with each other and what they're trying to accomplish? Possibly. Yeah. I mean, you know, as, as you, as the Fed increases interest rates, the cost of borrowing goes up, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it goes up kind of on, on lots of different things from credit cards to everything else. But, you know, the SBA 70 program has been a floating prime-based program, you know, ever since I've been in the industry, right? And so let me, to that, to that point, what you're seeing now is because prime has increased so much so quickly. January of this year, we actually rolled out a fixed rate program you know, 10 year fixed, 25 year fixed, you know, that's very, very favorable. And that's something that we've decided to do internally, not have anything to do with SBA. But, you know, that's changed the lending um, kind of environment for us um, as well. But, you know, not just us, there's a lot of banks out there now that are starting to look at fixed rate, doing fixed rate stuff when they've done stuff um, historically floating. So that, that's been huge because anytime that we're lending on a business and you got to a floating interest rate, we we're required to stress test that loan, right? So typically what we do is we've got, uh, when we're analyzing the debt service coverage, we'll add 3% to whatever the current interest rate is, right? Mm -hmm. And make sure that, hey, in the event of, you know, an increase into the prime rate, say, how does our debt service look now? We don't have to do that anymore, right? When we're dealing with a fixed rate program, we still offer the variable rates to clients, you know, but we also, every pretty much just about 90% of the people and the deals that we're doing now is all fixed rate pricing, um, you know, 10 years, 25 years, depending upon if you're buying real estate or if you're buying a business. And that's something to point out too, you know, to the audience is, you know, from an SBA perspective, if you're buying just a business, no real estate involved, you're operating from a lease location. The maximum term is 10 years. Okay. Yeah. If you're buying real estate, um, and this is on a, 7a which is again our most popular loan program if you're buying real estate that term goes to 25 years so what sba has allowed us to do too is that if we're financing more 
if you're buying a business and real estate, we used to have to blend that term on a weighted average of what the loan proceeds were. Now, if we're financing more real estate than we are business, we could actually amortize everything over 25 years, right? Which helps out tremendously with debt service, right? Your loan payment is lower than a blended term, but then you slap a fixed rate on top of that too, is that, you know, a lot of the uh, uncertainty, you know, as far as, you know, interest rates and all that stuff, it, it, it goes, it goes away. When you're talking about that, um, blended rate and the percentage business versus the percentage real estate. So you're saying to get that 25 year fixed term, you have to have a majority of the loan is the real estate versus the business, right? Correct. Of our loan proceeds. Yes. Now, so let me take an example. I'll kind of go off the top of my head here. If you're, let's just say you've got a million dollar project, 500 real estate, right? Uh, five or 550 real estate, 450 business, right? And let's say we do 10, 15% down onto everything is that obviously we've got more, more financing going towards real estate. We can amortize all of that over, over 25 years. Right. Okay. So, and, and that's, and that's huge because if you look at, you know, the difference, well, if, and if it's not, if the opposite is true, if we're finding more business in real estate, then we have to use our blended analysis. Right. But that might drop the long term down to 17 years from 25. I mean, that's a massive difference, right. In, in, in loan payment because, because of that term. Now, when you do a 10-year loan, it's still amortized over 25, right? So, no, it's a 10-year term amortized over 10, uh, uh, 10 years. So Okay, uh, so it'll be fully those, paid off at the end of 10, no balloon. No balloon, correct. No prepayment penalty on loan terms of, of 10 years or less, technically 15 years or less under SBA. There is no prepayment penalty. If it's above 15 years, it's mandated that it's, again, this is on the 7A program, it's mandated that it's a 5 Three, one, five percent the first year, three percent the second year, one percent in the final year, three year prepayment penalty. But again, ten years on a business acquisition, there's no prepay whatsoever. Okay. Well, and this brings up another good point. I mean, a lot of people are hoping that interest rates will fall again. So if they get a loan now, they get a loan that's ten years or less, so there's no prepay penalty. Can they refinance it when interest rates drop? They can. So there's, you know, historically, you know, the talk has been, you know, it's, um, and I don't want to dive too deep here, but under the SBA program, in order to refinance anything, you have to be refinancing a debt that's technically on unreasonable terms. And what that means is that the interest rate is a lot higher, right? Um, the, the, the biggest one, if there's like a balloon payment, right? If somebody went out there, got financing, and it's a, you know, 25 due in 10, that's automatically eligible for SBA because it creates a financial hardship at the end of that 10 years when we don't have balloon payments, right? So according to SBA guidelines, is it in order to be eligible, it has to be on unreasonable terms. The problem is SBA debt is always considered to be on reasonable terms given the alternative, right? However, I think that SBA right now is encouraging lenders that have fixed rates to go back and look at some of those other loans that were done, you know, probably by other banks and um, that are on variable, maybe, you know, 10, 11% today and look at refinancing those into something more reasonable and are, you know, under uh, the SBA 70 program into a fixed rate. So you, you never know what happens in the future, but, you know, obviously if interest rates drop way down, you're at a high fixed rate now, like I see SBA kind of um, wanting banks to kind of do something similar and refinancing some of that debt. Good. Now, in dealing with commercial real estate versus business acquisition, um, you know, a lot of people think that when you're buying commercial real estate, that it's solely based on the quality of the asset. But there's also a component on the quality of the credit of the borrower. Let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah, definitely. So, and I, I, I get this question quite often, right? And it happened recently, you know, anytime. So let's let me paint another example here. Let's say that you are a, um, a grocery store, for example, right? And you've been operating from a leased location and now your real estate is coming for sale, right? And you want the opportunity to buy that, get out of your lease and be, you know, own the real estate. What we as a bank look at is not just, you know, the quality of the real estate, like Chris said, but it's also, you know, whether that business generates enough cash flow to be able to pay the debt on that real estate, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and again, you know, in this program is that cash flow is really, you know, the it's king. It's the key to, you know, making a deal work, right? You know, obviously we want to look at the quality asset, but more importantly, 
like I said, is it make sure that that business. So under, and again, let me back up because under the SBA program, we can finance real estate, right? But that real estate needs to be at least 51% owner occupied by that subject business. So if Chris, you came to me and said, hey, Kelly, there's an office complex down the road or a commercial retail strip down the road, fully leased out. I want to buy that. Well, you'd be a landlord, right? That would right. be passive income for you. Um, that's not eligible on our SBA program. SBA says that the property needs to be at least 51% owner occupied by you as a business generating income. But yeah, I mean, other than that, you know, loan to value stuff that we look at, minimum down payment on real estate is 10%. So potentially we could do up to 90% financing on the purchase of commercial real estate. You know, but the key is, is it the business has to demonstrate they can repay that, that debt. Right. But now how about the business owner themselves and their personal credit? How does that factor into this? Equation? Yeah. So, you know, the on every single deal, the, the factors that we look at, you know, are really experience in the industry, right? We love to see a minimum of two years in managerial experience in the industry. If you take my grocery store example, obviously they've been running that business for a while. So that's, that's ideal. That's what we love to see. You know, but if you're just a, a true business acquisition, buying real estate or buying business or properties, it's the same thing. You know, we we look at your experience in the industry, the business that you're going to be operating or operating. Um, you know, we look at cash flow. You know, cash flow is the main driver of all of this, obviously. Um, personal credit history, obviously, you're applying for a loan. We want to see that you've got good credit. We aren't so much concerned about the store so much as more um, over, we're looking at what's what's contained in the credit report, track record of payments, right? Because uh, you could have, you know, we had this situation recent, recently to where we had a borrower that had one credit card, was dead diverse, didn't borrow money, but that one credit card had like a $500 limit. And I think they had like a $497 balance because they bought something and their score was very, very low, right? Yeah. But they've got perfect credit, right? So that's, that's something that we look at, but I mean, on the opposite side of the spectrum too, it's, it's if you've got a track record for, for late payments, not paying bills, right? And that kind of goes back historically, that's that's an issue, right? Regardless of kind of what the score is, right? So, um, and then collateral, you know, obviously then how much you're putting into the project, your capacity to borrow, if you've got the down payment, what's your net worth, you know, what other collateral that we have? Those are all really the factors that we look at on, on really any any deal. A lot of times there's multiple partners in a situation where you may have one person and they're like 90%, but maybe their parents invest with them or something. You know, how does that impact when you have a minority interest of an investor? Under SBA guidelines, anybody with a 20% or more ownership interest has to provide an unlimited personal guarantee, meaning that if we have a 10% owner and a 90% owner, that 90% owner is going to be our only guarantor. They need to qualify for the loan. Um, they've got to have all of those factors that I just spoke about up to a point to where the bank's comfortable with the risk. And if we are, you know, obviously then we'll move forward with the project. Um, if we have a situation to where the 90% owner doesn't qualify, right? The other thing we could say is, hey, listen, we need to we need to look at additional guarantors on this to make this thing work. So, but and and that's 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 often that we get requests like that. We'll analyze them and you know, if it works, it works. If not, we'll we'll have to revisit with additional guarantor. So, okay. So in that situation, you come in with a minority person, they've got, um, you know, other collateral or they've just got better credit and then that'll help you swing the deal. Yeah, definitely. And again, it all depends upon those factors, right? Just because a loan is fully collateralized, you know, that, that collateral isn't what's going to repay the, uh, payments on a monthly basis, right? The cash flow, the borrower's experience, right? And 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 then again, it's all boiled down to to risk, um, you know. So, but yeah, it's something that a, a partner can do is even if we've had situations where minority partners have stepped in and provide a personal guarantee to make mm -hmm. a deal work, right? Because maybe they added, you know, experience in the industry, or you know, they added in, you know, provided down payment. Um, sometimes pledge additional collateral up to a point to where the bank got comfortable. Let's talk a moment about key man buyouts. And so, cause you'll see sometimes, you know, someone has owned a business for 30 years, they're getting ready to retire and they have someone that they brought up as a key manager. And, and maybe that person has been on a smaller salary. So they don't have a lot of personal assets. 
And it, just talk a little bit about how that works for a key man buying out of business and maybe the real estate too, or the situation where the retiring owner wants to maintain the real estate lease back to the to the person acquiring the business. Yeah, definitely. And I have actually two of these going on right now, the exact same situation, right? So, and, and we love these. We love when the manager that's been there for, you know, maybe their whole career, a big portion of the career wants to come in and buy out this owner that's retiring, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's great because we know that the management that's in place before the acquisition is going to be the same management that's in place after the acquisition, right? That's key. Um, but to your point is, you know, there's, it's a minimum of 10% down, right? And so in situations like that, where you said if somebody's on a low salary and hasn't accumulated, you know, enough of a down payment to make that work, it's tough. It's tough because, you know, um, we might have really good management experience. I might have really good credit. We might have some collateral to pledge, no collateral at all, right? But the, the SBA mandates that you've got to have a minimum of 10% down payment into that project to make it work. So, and, you know, when you add the real estate, obviously the price goes up, right? But the owner is going to be leasing it back. That's that's great as well. You know what I mean? So, but, you know, the minimum down payment in that situation is still 10%. Now, when people are knowing that this is going to be happening in the future, you know, how can they plan for that by maybe um, gifting or selling stock to that key person, you know, starting maybe three or four years before the, they're ready to do a buyout? I wish more people did that. I wish more people did plan for that kind of succession planning, exit planning, you know, because I think a lot of times what happens is, you get somebody that's all of a sudden ready to sell and somebody that's all of a sudden ready to buy and they haven't kind of staged that business for sale or staged that borrower, obviously, to be, um, um, you know, to purchase that business. So um, what we go back and we look for is we look at, you know, basically when we go to closing, uh, we get two months of bank statements, right? Two months of bank statements showing that the funds that they're putting into the project is seasoning were required to do that. So, you know, um, we, I haven't had a situation to where the private company sells stock to the business owner. I mean, that's what we could look at. To Chris's point, is that if you have a 10% ownership in that business now, right? And I think this is where you're going with this. Chris. Right. Yeah. I was thinking it's like they work themselves up so they own 10% yeah. of the company. Does that 10% equity it count does. as their down payment? It, it does. It counts, it counts as the equity into the project for sure. And so in that situation, is it if, if they own 10% of the business and they're looking to acquire the, the additional 90% financing or the 90% of the stock, then absolutely. I mean, that's 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 a, a good way to make a transaction like that happen under somebody that basically maybe hasn't accumulated the net worth that we would typically see in that situation. Cool. All right. So my brain has um, been asking a lot of questions. I'd like to invite our participants who joined us today. What questions do you have that you'd like us to ask that we haven't asked so far? So don't be shy. Um, and if someone wants to open their mic and say hello, they got something interesting to say, I think now's a good time to do that. My name is Ryan Glidden. I'm from Napa, California. So awesome. um, welcome, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is, what's the most common way you see the SBA loan used for multifamily? So good question because multifamily apartments and this is something we didn't talk about is you know if you're buying a hotel for example hotels are eligible right bed and breakfasts are eligible um what's not eligible is financing residential property right multifamily residences apartment complexes aren't 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 eligible for sba financing so you know those are you know uh those would be financed with a conventional loan. That brings up a really good point. Conversation I think we had last month was the difference between residential and business. And a lot of people are looking at Airbnb type stuff as being business, but I think the SBA looks at that as being uh, residential, right? Correct, correct. So it kind of goes back to the hotel thing, right? So if you're if you're generating, if your income is based upon a transient population, a transient customer base where people are coming and going, that's that's eligible. You know, the reason apartment complexes aren't is because they're making their money off of long-term leases, right? Which which isn't eligible. Um, 
And so Airbnbs, you know, you got to, they're, they're residential properties, right? That are, should be financed with a residential loan at the end of the day, right? And I think what people are trying to do is that when you're buying a residential property, an Airbnb or, or a rental property, you know, the down payment through uh, residential loans, probably not 10%. Right. And I think that's why a lot of people are looking over to SBA to try to make those eligible, but, but, but they're not They're, you know, those, those need to be financed with residential loans. Okay. So Ling is asking in the chat, um, how can we track SBA interest rates? Is there like a report that comes out or do you just need to get to know an SBA lender and ask them to send you a rate sheet every Tuesday? Or, I mean, I'm saying many lenders are updating the rates on Tuesdays. So, yeah, you know, a good question. You know, it would it would be getting in contact with the lenders. You know, we don't post ours. We don't publish ours. Um, and I don't know many lenders that, that do in the SBA world. I mean, the interest rates, the guidelines, you know, the maximum are set by SBA, obviously. You know what I mean? But each bank is completely different. You know, like us having a fixed rate program that in some situations is below prime right now. You know, and it's all based upon risk for us and the type of deal that we're looking at, the strength of the transaction, strength of the borrower. So it would, it, you know, to, to answer your question, it would probably be getting in contact and staying in contact with some lenders and kind of seeing seeing what they're doing, because there's a lot of new stuff coming out for sure. And I think a lot more lenders are offering fixed rate and variable rate, kind of like what we're doing. Talk for a minute again. I don't know if we really cover this in enough depth about the bank's portion versus the SBA's portion and how does that work? You mean as far as a guaranteed, non-guaranteed, Chris? As yeah. So we'll keep so yeah, because so, you as the bank, you're you're making a single loan for the entire amount, or are there two different loans? I think that confuses okay. a lot of people. Right. So under the especially SBA, with what is the CDC and, and how does that tie into this whole equation? Yeah. So you're so under the SBA program. Um, which is, again, the loan that we primarily underwrite to. Uh, we're doing one single loan, right? SBA Step Center provides a 75% guarantee, but that's 75% guarantee of, of the loan that we're doing, right? So it's it's one single loan. So under, not to confuse everybody, is that under the 504 program, it's a little bit different. So when you're financing commercial real estate, under the 504, you've got the bank, there's a couple of different loans that come into place, right? We do essentially a conventional first loan right for generally 50 percent of the project the a certified development company what they call a cdc steps in and does the sba component and that's could be anywhere from 40 percent to 35 percent. they provide the additional financing right so um, our loan the bank's loan is a conventional loan it's not guaranteed the cdc's loan is guaranteed by sba under the 504 so in that situation there would be two payments um, made and, you know, um, there's a little bit more to it because we actually, without going down a rabbit hole here, we, we fund the whole thing and we do two interim, two a permanent loan and interim loan and the CDC steps and ends up financing our loan probably two to three months down the road. But for in the grand scheme of things, you're making two payments, you've got two different loans on the 504. Okay, so on the 504, you've got two loans. On the 7A program, you've got a single loan. Correct. Okay. And you mentioned something interesting that maybe people didn't catch. And that is two to three months later is when the CDC portion gets funded. Right. And Correct. so if I understand it correctly, there's actually the SBA is going to the bond market and selling bonds to underwrite these things. Is that right? Correct. We don't, we don't do a lot of 504s. Um, I think I've had two this year, I think that, have, that we've done, but essentially, yeah, you're correct. This the There's a, a period from the time that basically SBA approves a loan that the CDC basically goes and a bond money is raised two, two or three months down the road. And that's the money that comes in and pays off our, our interim second. And because it's a bond capital raise or bond sale, the interest rate on that portion, you don't actually know it until the bond sells, correct? Yeah, that's correct. So every month, the what they call the debenture, the venture rate is published. Um, you can see it on you know just about any CDC's website, and that's 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 the interest rate set for that month. The actual interest rate doesn't become fixed or set or established until the month that basically the bond money is raised and the CDC funds are long. So, 
So it seems like there's a little bit of risk, especially in a rising interest rate market of what could happen between, you know, during that two to three month period. Are there any limits to how much that interest rate could go up? No, there's not, you know, but the beauty of that program too, is it that the, it's, it's a 25 year fixed program, right? So there, there is a risk between the time that the bank funds or loans, the deal closes and the, you know, the, the sale of the debenture. I mean, there, there's, there's, there's a little bit of time to where that rate can go up, but you know, the, again, the beauty of that is, is it is a 25 year fixed program and um, you know, it's not a variable rate program. What other questions are you getting that we haven't covered today? I mean, is anything popping on the top of your head? No, I'm, you know, there's basically everything right now centered around these changes that SBA has uh, um, put in place that actually go into effect um, August 1st. It got pushed back. It was supposed to go into effect July 1st. It got pushed back to August 1st, but a lot of the new stuff, you know, the biggest one is really that, um, and we're still trying to figure out, um, but um, historically when you're, buying a business has had to be a complete change of ownership, right? So um, what SBA has uh, changed recently is that it, you can do a partial change of ownership. So somebody could come in and buy, you know, instead of 100% of the business, you know, maybe, you know, 90%, 80% and the existing owner can stay there. SBA wanted a complete change of ownership, you know, in the in the past because they wanted somebody to come in and they didn't want to have the seller remain on, you know, into the business. Um, so this is, this is huge. And, um, you know, we're trying to go ahead, Chris. Well, I was going to say, so last time I spoke with you or your partner, um, I was hearing that this is still in flux and you guys weren't sure, but now you're at a point where this, these things are going into effect on August 1st. As, as of right now they are. Okay. And so the biggest change that you're seeing is that you don't have to have a complete change of ownership? Correct. Correct. Now we're still trying to figure out, I mean, the way that it sounds is that, you know, if the seller is going to remain on and have that 20% or more ownership interest is that seller is going to have to now provide a guarantee for the borrower's loan. Right. So I don't think we're probably going to see a whole heck of a lot of that, but, um, and then the other big change too, is that, you know, SBA, um, says that, you know, loan amounts on $500,000 and below. Um, so $500,000 and above SBA is basically, you know, one thing we didn't talk about is the collateral guidelines. I get a lot of questions about collateral, right? So on SBA 7A loans, if you're buying a business, a business acquisition, and we're financing primarily goodwill, right? So SBA, um, we have to take a UCC filing on those business assets, right? Um, that typically don't provide a whole lot of collateral in the grand scheme of things. So the SBA says if there's outside collateral, these would be basically borrower's personal residence, we have to look at that collateral as being cross-collateralized, right? Up to a point where either the loan is fully collateralized or there's no collateral left to pledge. And so those guidelines are set forth by SBA, right? So if we're doing like a million dollar business acquisition that includes $100,000 in inventory and then $100,000 in FF&E and $800,000 in goodwill, obviously that goodwill it doesn't have a collateral value to it. And if we have personal residence on the side that has equity, we've got to secure those. What SBA has changed is said that on loan amounts of $500,000 and below, um, SBA doesn't require collateral. Right? Wow. So, yeah. That's so, a huge change coming up. And that's it, set it, for August 1st? August 1st. So um, what, it, what they've basically done is put it at the bank's discretion, right? Mm. So, and... What we're trying to look at is what SBA says is that the bank is to use their non-SBA lending guidelines to kind of make that determination. So in a lot of banks like ourselves, our non-SBA lending goes to our commercial, right? So um, we're having to kind of change some things internally to kind of look at possibly doing some of these loans at $500,000 or below and you know not taking collateral. But at the end of the day, it all boils down to risk, right? So even though the SBA says, hey, um, it's not required, we as a bank to underwrite and get comfortable with the deal in some situations may have to take collateral, right? Whether we have a weakness in some of the other factors, right? Either um, credit history or experience, you know, at the, again, at the end of the day, it all boils down to risk, but that's good to have that out there with SBA because if we can make the determination, hey, we're comfortable with the risk, 
at a loan amount of five hundred thousand dollars and below, and we're comfortable not taking that collateral. Now, now we can move forward with that loan. Who is it that was pushing for loosening the collateral standards? I mean, when I look at what's happening in our country with things like the government wanting to forgive student loans and voice that onto the taxpayer and stuff, it seems like maybe this is kind of along that same path. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, it's a good question. And I, I don't have an answer for that. You know, um, um, there's uh, the National Association of Government Guaranteed Lenders, which is our largest lobbying group. You know, may have had something to do with that, been behind that. But um, yeah, you know, it's 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 um, it's good to have because it, what it does is it encourages lenders to lend to those smaller businesses, knowing that that guarantee is going to be out there, right? Yeah. Even if that, there's no collateral on the deal or or we don't take additional collateral. On those smaller deals, what percentage of the loan is actually guaranteed by the SBA versus the risk that the bank is taking? Seventy five percent. So it's still 75%. Yeah, Okay. correct. So let's move back to that first thing about uh, partial purchase. So how is that going to impact on key man purchases? So that, you know, it seems like that would be really beneficial to that situation we were talking about earlier, where a manager who's been with the company wants to buy out the owner, but the owner retains partial interest in it. So that maybe they're doing a structured buyout over time or something. Does that work? Depends how they structure it, I guess. Right. So what what where it's going to be really, really beneficial is when you have a business that requires like a license, right? Let's say an HVAC company, right? right. When you have to license to operate the business, and maybe the manager there doesn't have the license, right? Um, and sometimes, and you know, depending upon the type of license, the type of business, it, it could take months to do. I mean, a contractor, for example. Most business acquisition deals that we look at are take you know around sixty days, sixty sometimes ninety days if the liquor license is involved. Mm -hmm. um, but in that situation, you know you can potentially look at the seller staying on, retaining the license, right, as maybe a ten or fifteen percent owner, and the manager coming in and buying the business and not having to go um, through the hoops of getting the license before closing, and maybe down the road end up getting obtaining a license and and buying that. Uh, the remaining shares of the seller out. Wow. So there's a lot of interesting things going on here. A lot of moving parts. Yep. Yep. And that's part of all the new stuff that SBA has done. So we're, I mean, we're excited to see August 1st roll around. Um, there's some training kind of going on through SBA and through Nagel, uh, you know, to kind of get the lenders up to speed to kind of make sure that we're, we're doing everything correctly according to these new guidelines. It's probably varies from institution to institution. But with your bank, do you guys, are you lending to, for putting stuff into your uh, portfolio to hold long term or are you lending to sell it on the secondary market? Really good question, because if you would have asked me this last year, we were, you know, that we were selling everything on the secondary market that we could. Right. That's that's how our business model was was built. Um, you know, so it, when you're. When you're doing a variable rate loan or any SBA loan, basically, it's got a 75% guarantee. That 75% guarantee you could sell on the secondary market, right? There's investors that will pay a premium, sell off 75%. The bank will get their 75% plus the premium. And then we can relend that money two or three different times, right? Um, that 25% that we didn't sell, we retain on our portfolio and we earn interest income on that. So Fast forward, that's how it's operated since the 15 years that I've been at the bank. Fast forward to January of this year, now that we're offering fixed rate uh, pricing, um, you know, obviously the premiums on the secondary market aren't as desirable versus uh, a floating rate, right? So um, the fixed rate deals that we're doing now, we basically shift and we're portfolioing everything and keeping those on our portfolio and earning interest income. So, okay. And why is that shift really happening? Um, it's something that we put into place because we we saw um, just how quickly prime increased, um, you know, wanted to be competitive in the market, wanted to continue to lend to small businesses, right? Um, and so we we put this program together, the fixed rates to, to keep doing deals, keep staying competitive, and we've got the portfolio room to start putting them on our portfolio now, so... Wow, that's really interesting to see such a drastic change in your business model. Yep. 
Yep. And it's, it's, it's been good this year. We're, we're excited about it. So are you seeing other banks doing that or do you not know if other banks are doing the same thing? Yeah, you've, we've, we're, we're hearing other banks doing it. We're hearing other banks that are sticking to the variable rate, you know, as well. Um, you know, so, but there's always been banks out there that have, that have offered fixed rate um, stuff. Typically it's, it's been more so for, you know, you know, um, commercial real estate, I think. Um, although, you know, obviously I think, um, I can only speak for what we're doing and what I know about ourselves, obviously, you know, but we're, we're offering them on business acquisition loans, 10 year fix, you know, you know, without real estate and then obviously with real estate stuff too. So, but I, I think they're out there. I think a lot more banks are starting to kind of, um, um, offer fixed rates, you know, as, as prime continues to increase. I've had a lot of fun asking questions. I hope you think that I've asked good questions today. I do. I, I think it was good. I think, uh, I think you peppered me pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know that um, in our conversation a week or two ago when we were sending this uh, call up, you said that you could do two or three days of training on SBA lending. We're going to be offering a workshop through the Realtor Commercial Alliance of Orange County on SBA lending. What are some of the advanced topics that are going to be covered in that workshop? What do you, What are you thinking that you want to cover? Yeah, you know, probably diving more down into credit, what we look at, you know, ideal borrowers, um, you know, what deals are probably tough to finance. I mean, at the end of the day, anytime I go meet with people and give presentations and stuff, I like to talk about what what we're getting done, right, as well. And, and then the stuff that's harder to finance under under SBA, we'll probably dive deep more into the uh, changes that are coming up. We're getting closer to August 1st, you know, so, but just uh, throw a little bit more advanced stuff to, to the audience this way. Perfect. And so for those of you who are on today, I hope all of you registered that you didn't use someone else's uh, registration to get on today's call. For those of you who are joining us by YouTube or in listening to this, uh, who knows, maybe years in the future, you know, if you'd like to connect with, uh, with Kelly and I, please send an email to me. I tend to screen stuff so that he doesn't get inundated with things. And then Kelly and I work together as a team to help get things funded. And my email address is there on the screen, chris.vote.cre at gmail. And just put in the subject that uh, you want to talk about SBA lending so that we can connect. Kelly, I really appreciate you coming today. Everyone who joined us, I really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you very much. And do you have any last words? No, thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. This was great. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.